Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Jennifer Kaur. I'm the Executive Director of the Tennessee Historical Society. Uh, this will be our first session this year for 2023 of Tennessee 101, the History of Tennessee Music. Coming up, we will be having sessions on HBCU marching bands, murder ballads, and band leader Francis Craig. That will be taking place in February, March, and April to finish out our season. If you wanna register for any of these, go to our website to the programs page and you can see right there the uh, maroon and yellow logo for Tennessee 101. That will take you to uh, a page where you can select the programs that you want to register for. You can also explore past programming that we've had and view the recordings of the previous sessions if you missed any of those. Um, Let's see, so if you wanna access resources for this session and our speaker has promised me he's gonna send me the slides as well, you can go to the little box that says resources and that will take you to the Padlet, which is a fancy name for cloud storage. And the Padlet looks like this and we have playlists there for you, links to websites or online exhibits so that you can do more exploration of these topics. If you did miss anything, you can go to that page and then down at the bottom on the page itself, you can see there's the recording embedded on the page. If you have any questions uh, or comments during this session, please put them in the little Q&A box. We really encourage you to um, help us have a lively conversation once the pre presentation is done. So just drop them in there and my coworker Nikki and I will field them at the end of the session. Follow us on social media. Here are all of our handles. This is a good way of finding out when we have new programming coming up. We also want to tell you about Tennessee Talks. This is our online book discussion club. This is for members only. So if you're not a member, this is a good reason to join. Coming up next, uh, next Tuesday, we're going to be discussing Loretta Lynn, coal miner's daughter. And then in February, Ties That Bind, the story of an Afro-Cherokee family. In March, Memphis, a novel. And in April, Hawks Done Gone, which is a classic of Appalachian literature. Our discussant for all of these is Carol Busey. And we often have a special guest who has expertise on that particular subject join us. We wanna thank our sponsors, Humanities Tennessee and the Tennessee Arts Commission. Without their support, we would not be able to bring you this programming. And this is just a reminder that we are a nonprofit 501c3. So if you would like to join as a member or if you'd like to make a donation, please do that through our website. And now I'm going to turn uh, it over to Dr. Sean Pitts, who is one of the co-conveners of our sessions. Um, and Sean's going to tell us what to expect tonight. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, I want to say welcome to everyone and I uh, hope you had a great holiday season. Welcome back to... Uh, the second half of Tennessee 101, uh, Tennessee Music. Uh, uh, great first sessions, and we're lo really looking forward to the second half, too. Uh, this evening's no uh, exception. So I'm going to introduce uh, my co-convener, and uh, and he'll then inter introduce uh, the guests for this evening. Uh, Dr. Langston Wilkins is an associate professor of folklore and African-American studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. His academic interests include African-American music and folk life, um, hip hop culture, urban uh, folklore, and car culture, among other fascinating areas of research. Before joining the ranks of academia, Dr. Wilkins uh, worked at, uh, as a um, public folklorist at Tennessee Arts Commission, Humanities Tennessee, uh, great Tennessee connections there, and the Center uh, for Washington Cultural Traditions. In each of those positions, uh, uh, I should say, he doc uh, helped document and offered assistance for artists, musicians, craftspeople, uh, cultural organizations uh, uh, working or presenting uh, in traditional art forms. Uh, beyond that, I, uh, I'm uh, privileged to count uh, Langston a good friend and co convener in this series, and it's my honor to, uh, to welcome Dr. Wilkins and his guest presenter uh, to the first session of Tennessee 101 for 2023. Oh, thanks so much, Sean. Right. Let me say I'm an assistant professor. I just don't want to jinx myself oh, or get ahead of myself. <laughs> no, it's all good. All good. Cross your fingers up. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, I'm delighted to introduce tonight's uh, guest lecturer, Dr. Nathan E. Gibson, who is the audiovisual preservation archivist at the University of Wisconsin-Madison 
and a lecturer in the Mead Witter School of Music, so go Badges. Uh, he is the author of The Start A Story, The House That Country Music Built, which came out through the University Press of Mississippi, and recently produced a tribute to the living legends of Star Day Records, Nate Gibson and the Star of Nate Gibson and the Stars of Star Day, which was released through Bear Family Records. He holds a PhD from the Department of Folklore and Ethnomusicology at Indiana University, go Hoosiers. He's also an incredible musician, record collector, and radio show host. So please do go check out Back to the Country, uh, the radio show, which he hosts every second Wednesday of the month from 9 to 12 Central on W O rtfm.org so check that out tomorrow and he's an awesome friend of mine and a great guy and so i'm super hyped to hear his presentation so i'll turn things over to nate thanks so much langston and sean and jennifer thank y'all um let's see do i need to share this screen right now y'all see everything yes that's great perfect, perfect. Well, I, I thank you all, and thank you to the Tennessee Historical Society uh, for having me today and for this opportunity to talk about my favorite topic, uh, one of my favorite topics in the whole world, Star Day Records. Uh, so we have approximately an hour, and I'm going to attempt to give a brief history of what Star Day is uh, to break down why Star Day came to Tennessee in the first place, uh, and a word about the legacy about the Star Day studio, which was just demolished last year. Uh, quite recently. And then maybe I'll try to end with some suggestions of how we might collectively move forward and preserve Star Day without a physical building in, in Tennessee. And with any luck, I'll have some time for questions. Uh, so I hope you uh, are with me here. And then as Langston mentioned, tomorrow I'm hosting Back to the Country. And I it's a, a radio program started by Bill Malone. It's three hours. Uh, I will be playing a lot of the audio that I'm talking about today on that show tomorrow morning. So they'll be linked together. I thought it'd be better to save some time today and do the audio portion of it tomorrow. Uh, that said, let's talk about Star Day. Uh, let's see if my slides are gonna work for me. Do to do, do. Yeah, it worked. Uh, so Star Day Records, Star Day is a combination of two surnames, Starnes and Daly. And Jack Starnes, his real name was Burl Houston, uh, super insider stuff there. Uh, but he went by Jack, and uh, he was married to Neva Starnes, and together they owned a couple nightclubs in the Beaumont area. But most famously, what he's most known for is he got Lefty Frizzell uh, out of his uh, contract with uh, Beck and Satherly, and he became Lefty Frizzell's personal manager in the around 1951. And the, it didn't go well, and Lefty and Jack split acrimoniously. Uh, with a lawsuit, and um, the claim was he was having Lefty play Canada, and then Florida, and then Washington, and then Tennessee, and it just didn't make any sense, and Lefty quit the tour, and Jack sued him. Um, there's a lot of other details involved, but Jack sued him and won, and Jack got $20,000, which pretty much broke Lefty in 1953, and Jack Starnes now had a lot of cash and wanted to do something with that money. So he started Star Day Records, but he didn't want to do it alone. So he uh, convinced Pappy Daly to join him in the effort. And that was a good move on Jack's part because Pappy Daly was the owner of Daly's Record Ranch in Houston, uh, a giant record store where a lot of local artists were broadcast over the airwaves from in-person in shows. He was also the largest jukebox distributor in Texas and really had a an empire of record distribution in Texas. And uh, he also had a reputation for knowing local artists, paying for their records, sending to, to make the records, sending the tapes to four star records in California, and then promising that record company he would buy enough to put in his jukeboxes that the company would always break even. So he gave starts to Webb Pierce and Hank Lachlan and George Jones and others. Um, but he was very well connected music musically throughout Texas. And um, yeah, those two paired up and they released four records in 1953. However, before getting too into the very first records, I want to point out Neva Starnes. She is often overlooked in the history of Star Day Records. Uh, but Neva Starnes Dupree, I think, deserves to be in that conversation of pioneering record women. Um, Miriam Abramson, Lillian McMurray, Estelle Axton, Macy Henry. 
Um, there's a lot that get a lot of uh, notoriety. Neva doesn't. And uh, she, that's Neva's cafe there. And that is where uh, Arlie Duff stopped by the roadside and started talking up Neva about the fact that he was writing songs. And Neva said, well, let me hear some. And he performed with the house band, which at the time was Lefty Frizzell's backing band, the uh, Cherokee Cowboys, the Western Cherokees at that time. And uh, yeah, she she ran the cafe. She was the manager for Lefty Frizzell's band uh, after Lefty and his band split. And uh, she had her own uh, managing and booking agency, as you can see in this contract with Patsy Elshire right there. Uh, she managed a lot of acts. She managed Gene Shepard in the early days and and others. And uh, interestingly, Neva's is still standing, that cafe. Uh, it's called Squeezes now, but it's on Old Voth Road in Beaumont. And uh, last time I was there, there were some people at the bar just talking about Benny Barnes and his family, which was pretty remarkable. Uh, but that's Neva. And and I, I have done a whole presentation about Neva uh, for the uh, Association for Recorded Sound Collections. And that link will be one of the links you can contact uh, access in the Padlet if you want to know more about her. But the, Pappy and Jack Starnes released four records, and they didn't have publishing information on them. Uh, they didn't quite know what to, how to get them sold, so they reached out to Don Pierce, who uh, had, was just getting free from Four Star Records, um, who Pappy Daly had been working with. And Don said, you know, I think you guys have a, a lot of promise. I would like to work with you. So after those first four releases in 1953, uh, Don Pierce flew to Texas and they struck up a deal where Jack Starnes would do all of the booking and promoting. Um, Pappy Daly would do all the record distribution and sales through his record store. And Don Pierce would be driving coast to coast, pushing records to radio DJs and different vendors. Uh, so as you can see in the bottom right, Starday was technically a California company. Um, there is the address in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, up until 1957, January of 1957, Starday was based in Los Angeles, um, although some of the record labels still say Beaumont in the very early days um, because Jack Starnes was uh, telling people that it was his label and his label alone and putting Beaumont on things. <laughs> And there's a contract that you can see at the bottom where Jack Starn signed it, sole owner of Starday Records. That didn't go over well with Pappy or Don Pierce. Um, Don Pierce was a very savvy businessman. He was an economics major from the University of Washington, spent three years in the Army, got out and got into country music records at Four Star. Uh, that's where he was producing the Maddox Brothers and Rose. Uh, he produced Philadelphia Lawyer and some other things. Uh, but as they started this company, Together, Don Pierce and Jack Starnes clashed, so Starnes sold his share shortly after 1954, June of 1954, and then it became solely uh, Pappy Daly and Don Pierce. So they should have renamed it like Day Pier or uh, Pier Day, uh, but they didn't. They left it as Star Day, and uh, they had some success early on. Uh, some of their biggest stars are photographed here. And I recently came into a collection of uh, really amazing photographs, dozens of photographs from 1954 at the Eagles Hall in Houston, Texas. And you can see George Jones and Glenn Barber and Sonny Burns and Arlie Duff and the Western Cherokees and so many amazing photos. So I hope to do something with those soon, but there's a snippet, a sampling. Um, but these early records were pretty successful for a new label. Y'all Come uh, was covered by Bing Crosby, there you can see the sheet music, and that was one of the first four releases. And then Red Haze, A Satisfied Mind, became a number one hit for Gene Shepard, I think Porter Wagner, I think Red Foley, uh, huge, huge hit. And uh, they had several others, and of course, George Jones was the big breakout star uh, with Why Baby Why being his first big hit. <clears throat> Another interesting thing about starting in the very early days, 1955 and 56, uh, they were dabbling with rock and roll. Excuse me, I have to take one drink. Uh, it's the Elvis Elvis Presley's touring mate, Rudy Tootie Grazel, made some rockabilly records. George Jones did it too, but he didn't want to, so they used the name Thumper Jones, uh, 
Leon Payne did some rock and roll. He didn't want to, but he called himself Rock Rogers. Sonny Fisher made some great records, as did Bill Mack. And um, eventually they caught the eye of Mercury Records, who just passed on Elvis Presley and RCA got him. And now they're looking for a record label with some success in the country field. And they need to do something because Jim Denny had just been ousted at the Grand Ole Opry as the manager. At the end of 1956, um, there was a, a publishing uh, fiasco and he was ousted. And his replacement was D. Kilpatrick, who started the country division at Mercury Records. And now D. Kilpatrick, who you can see in the photo there, he got to pick his replacement. And at the DJ convention in Nashville in October, he came up with a plan. And he said, why don't we combine Mercury and Starday Records? And we will have Pappy Daly book all of the uh, Grand Ole Opry talent through Texas, and he'll be a Mercury distributor. And Don Pierce will leave California, and he'll come to Nashville and take my job. And I go to the Opry. Seemed like a pretty good plan. So January 1st, 1957 is the birth of the Mercury Star Day Country Series. And the first release was George Jones's Don't Stop the Music on January 2nd of that year. And unfortunately, this dream scenario for Star Day only lasted one year. It was a good move, though, for Don Pierce to get out of Nashville. He was in L.A., and they, he got free office space at the Coast Record Pressing Plant as long as Coast got to press all of the Star Day records. Um, the problem is they kept breaking all the time, shipping from L.A. across the country. And he wanted to ship with plastic products in Memphis because it was more centrally located. But also, he had bought the Hollywood record label from John Dolphin. And there was a lot of controversy about royalty payments. Um, and some artists on that Hollywood label were really upset, and Don Pierce didn't quite know what to do about all of it. Um, so he was kind of glad to get out of that situation. And interestingly, when Don left, John Dolphin, the famous record store or record producer and record store owner, um, took over Don's office and was sitting in Don's office at his desk um, a year after Don moved to Tennessee. And he was shot to death by an artist upset about royalties. Uh, so Don felt like that was a good move for him to go to Tennessee and to get out of that situation, uh, which was quite dangerous. Uh, but the uh, the move to Tennessee, not just because it avoided death, turned out to be a, uh, a good business decision for many reasons. The Starday Mercury deal only lasted one year. Uh, Mercury was mad because Starday would only record songs that they had publishing rights to, and they felt like they weren't getting the best songs. Uh, and so after one year, they terminated the deal. And Pappy Daly told Don Pierce, uh, Mercury doesn't want you anymore. And George Jones said he wants to stay with me, not you. Um, so you should probably leave. And so Don Pierce had a couple months where he thought about what he should do. He had just moved his family from California, his daughter and his wife, to Nashville. Um, and he decided to stay and he decided not just to stay, but to stay in that office that he built out uh, that they bought out there on Dickerson Pike and Madison. And he he stayed out there because when he went to Nashville, everybody told him, you got to be on Music Row. You want to be on 16th Ave. And Don said, I don't want anything to do with the other record companies. And I don't want anything to do with the Nashville um the, the the business of songwriters coming by each place, selling their songs to me. I want to pick the songs that I get. I'm going to stay out there on Dickerson Pike. And so he was out in Madison and he decided to start brand new out in Madison. And that building pictured right there, they just took the word Mercury off the window. And the cool thing for, for Don Pierce in starting Stardate is that while he was at Mercury, uh, he hired Shelby Singleton, gave him his first job in the music industry to sell Mercury Records. Uh, but he also met Roger Miller and released Roger Miller's first records. Um, Pappy and Don sent Roger back to Texas with George Jones to make his first records, but you can see it there. Poor little John was his first. But he also wrote songs for Jimmy Dean. Uh, but it also introduced him to a lot of bluegrass being associated with Mercury. Uh, he put out records by Jim Eanes and Bill Clifton and the Stanley Brothers and the Brewster Brothers and Carl Story, and he fell in love with bluegrass in Tennessee. 
And when that came to an end and Mercury said, we don't want Star Day anymore. We also don't want any of that bluegrass stuff. And the only thing we really want is George Jones and Benny Barnes, those two. Everybody else can go. And so Don thought it over for a bit and he said, you know what? I'm here in, in Tennessee, in Madison. I'm just going to take all those bluegrass artists that were cut because I know there's a market for that. It might be small, it might be niche, but there's a market. And he signed every bluegrass band he could think of in 1958 and 1959. And he started releasing them and filling jukeboxes throughout the South with these bluegrass records. And this paid off in a huge way years later as part of the folk revival and the bluegrass boom. And Don had amassed the largest bluegrass catalog in the world and had put out some incredible groundbreaking records like Rank Stranger by the Stanley Brothers and Buzz Busby Lost and Jim and Jesse's Pardon Me and Hard Hearted and so many great records by Bill Clifton, the first tribute to the Carter family. Just a lot of great records. And interestingly, on all of those records, he had these sleeves. And even by 1958, on his sleeve that he was promoting, this is actually a 1960 sleeve, but on the 1958 one, it says the same thing. It says, preserving the heritage of American country music. So he was taking a preservation standpoint in his business from a very early perspective, uh, from a very early time. And uh, not only was he interested in bluegrass, he was very interested in gospel music. And on the first LP inner sleeves, you, they're very hard to find, but you find one of them. Uh, they look like that. And they're just an ad for gospel EPs. And I think it's interesting to note that he he felt that gospel music should be released on EP format and bluegrass on a single format and country music generally on an LP format. But uh, this right here is a, a selection of the EPs, which he very heavily invested in uh, some really great, great music. And he amassed between 1958, and 1960, the largest gospel catalog in the country. Um, it does say, I'll point out on those records founded 1952. And that's not true. <laughs> uh, it was founded in 1953. I think he just got confused, but uh, now a lot of people think Starday was founded in 1952. <laughs> um, and then he also found a lot of early success with uh, some of these records. So the country records, uh, Alabama became a big hit. The first artist to record at the Starday studio, uh, Frankie Miller, had a bunch of hits early on, Black Land Farmer and Family Man. Um, so many great records. But that's in, what I wanted to point out was on the logo that you would see uh, over here, it says Country and Gospel International. And on some of the ads that Don Pierce placed around early 1960, he, he expands a little bit on what he means by that. Uh, he says, operating to capacity, Starday is helping to preserve the heritage of American country music by international exploitation of traditional recordings by top artists in an expanding catalog. Um, so he was very much interested in taking country music made there in Tennessee and pushing it internationally. He traveled the globe in 1959 and 1960. He went to England, he went to Japan, he went to Belgium, he went to Germany, pushing country music. And he got the Starday catalog uh, to be sold through Canada, Japan, uh, the UK. Uh, and if you go to the Netherlands, you can find those really cool Starday sleeves in the lower right. And uh, a lot of times there are Starday records that were never released in the U.S. that you can only find international pressings of. So I put a few cool ones up there. But I think Don was unique in his approach to saying, you know, I could sell this stuff locally and I can sell this stuff across the country, even nationally. But he really was the first to go um all in on the international aspect of country music and his product. And he also, early on in Tennessee, uh, Don was interested in publishing. He's very, very savvy about the money that can be made from publishing songs. And the way that he built his publishing empire was through custom recording service. So an artist can pay $100 and they can get 300 records and they will come with envelopes that they can mail to record stations or they can sell them off the stage if they want. But when they did that and they sent their records to Don Pierce, Don said, well, if I like the song, I'll put it on Starday. 
but if I don't like the song, I'm still going to keep the publishing. So Stardust got the publishing on most all of these records that were sent through a custom pressing service, and they built a pretty big catalog. So Lonnie Irving's Pinball was sent as a custom record. Don liked it, and so he reissued it on Stardust, and it became a, a really big hit. Um, I had to put a Wisconsin record up there because artists from all over the country and Canada sent records in to this service, hoping they would get their record on Stardust. Darnell Miller uh, was this one didn't get reissued on Stardust, but he was then picked up and his next records were on Stardust. And this was also an important ground for artists to just test out what it would be like to sell records. Willie Nelson's record up there, that was his first ever record. And that was a Stardust custom pressing. Lucky Ray, that was with his brothers Link and Doug. So those are Link Ray's first records. Uh, the Johnny Kale Quintet was J.J. Kale's uh, first record, minus the uh, Mercury spooky record he did uh but jj kale's earliest records and the first version of you're still on my mind an empty bottle broken heart and you're still on my mind uh, that was a star day custom press all sorts of good stuff um uh, there was one time for two years there's a picture there of the star day townhouse where don pierce finally caved in the late 60s and opened the townhouse on music avenue uh on music row for two years ish and red hayes who wrote a satisfied mind uh, left hank thompson's band to front that office for a short period but then uh, they closed it up so publishing is an important part of the whole empire and uh they're putting out a whole bunch of records and you can see a nice picture there the one thing that they had to do <laughs> i'm just looking at the pictures i'm not even following my notes anymore um they were uh, building publishing. Oh yeah, they had to build a studio. <laughs> the only thing that was problematic and very expensive was that they kept paying for studio sessions around town. There were at that time in the late 50s, three major recording studios in Nashville. And so in 1959, Don Pierce's friend, John Story convinced him to build his own studio and it became the fourth major studio in Nashville. And there's a picture of it. You can see that big white building behind the Starday office. That's the warehouse, but to the left of it, slightly lower, you can see a little corner of it. That's the studio. It was built onto the back of the office on the side of the warehouse, and they built a studio. And this studio, they had to keep it busy now because you have some artists, but you, you don't have enough to keep this studio busy all the time. So he came up with this idea of a Nashville subsidiary. And whereas artists, this is kind of, I'll show you one example of this, but artists would often send in a record for the custom service, and then Don Pierce would press them up and keep the publishing and give them 300 records, and he gets 100 bucks. Uh, he decided, when some people wrote to him and said, hey, would you press my record? Don Pierce, case in point, Lloyd Howell here, in 1961, wrote a letter and it sent a tape to Don Pierce and said, would you press this? And Don said, uh, it's pretty good, but it could be better. And if you came to Nashville and recorded in our studio, uh, you'd have a better record. And I just might be interested in releasing that. So Lloyd Howell, I, I thank him for keeping everything. And the Blue Stars here, they made some cool records for Fortune uh, back in the day. But they decided, OK, we'll come to Nashville. We'll record at your studio. They paid $100. You can see their studio receipt right there. Tommy Hill was their engineer. and. They made a record and Don Pierce paid, they paid for the studio session and the musicians and Don Pierce paid to press the record. And almost every one of these Nashville records says a Star Day, a Tommy Hill Star Day studio production. And there were um, just about 300, 325 Nashville records released and they are great. They're really great. A lot of them really cool, but it's private press, small press, mostly custom recordings recorded at the Star Day studio. And uh, that's one way to keep the studio busy. Um, and another way was to start a jingle company. And uh, so they have this really interesting uh, company. Eddie Arnold was the vice president along with Vic Willis. And they started the first jingle company in Nashville. And man, they put out so many cool records in there. Um, there's a picture right there of Dottie West, who made her first records in 1960 in that studio. Um, she's making a, a jingle right there with Red Savine. I also, uh, a while back, found a jingle tape of demo jingles made by um, Farron Young and Barbara Mandrell and Johnny Cash. And uh, 
Minnie Pearl, and a whole bunch of really cool ones, Fire and Young. Uh, they all recorded jingles in that studio for the Custom Jingles of Nashville Company. Uh, there's a check I have from Red Savine. I have some written to Pete Drake and others too, getting paid $130 to sing on the jingles. Um, it also became really popular studio for demo recordings. And I remember the first time I went out to the Stardust studio, Charlie Dick, who was Patsy Klein's uh, widow, told me that, oh yeah, Patsy Klein, she came in here. Patsy made a bunch of demos in the studio. And I was like, do you have any video of that? And he's like, no, I've seen video, but I don't have it. And I've looked for it a long time. And then I just checked again yesterday while I was preparing this. And uh, the video is online. You can see Patsy Klein recording in the studio. So I put the little YouTube link on there. Um, but there's also a picture there of Carl Smith recording with Tommy. Um, and that's his his brother-in-law. And you've got Farron Young uh, over there. And mo most famously, Jim Reeves and his big hit, Distant Drums. The drums were actually recorded in, the, in that Star Day studio. And then they took it uh, across town. But yeah, lots of lots of great demos made right there. And um, the real interesting thing, though, about Starday in this era, in the early 60s, as Starday is just starting to make a profit uh, from those early hits I showed you, is Don Pierce's commitment to LPs. And he really firmly believed the country music buyer was an adult and the adult buyer wanted LPs. And he put a lot of money into full color photos and uh, full color sleeves and extensive liner notes where he credited all the band musicians on the back not always but frequently and just really went into the lp that bluegrass special one is hilarious because he loved five string banjo but the person who designed the cover did not know what a five string banjo looked like so they just made up where the fifth string would be in the headstock which i find pretty hilarious uh but he made a lot of great iconic bluegrass lps really important ones and he also made a lot of really great gospel LPs, gospel quartets, bluegrass sacred music, instrumental uh, records, and uh, the Lewis family there, the most recorded group on Starday Records, um, and Little Roy Lewis, uh, the most recorded Starday artist of all time is there, the Oak Ridge, early Oak Ridge Quartet before they were the Oak Ridge Boys. Um, just really, really cool, I think, to see the LP covers. So I put some of them up here because... Um, there was a time in 1958 where they were putting out more uh, singles than LPs, but by 1961, they were doing more LPs than they were singles each year and just really pushing the long play record long before other country music labels were doing that. And they weren't just pushing uh, LPs as a format. They were, uh, I think, really instrumental in pushing the idea of a country identity um, at this time when most country music people, or most country music records coming out of Nashville in 1962, 1961, were not really, uh, they weren't sitting with a rooster on their lap or holding a pig um, or sitting on hay bales or driving tractors um, or riding horses as George Jones is doing there. Um, they were usually something more like this. Um, in suits holding be trying to be pretty classy there was a a country politan movement at the time and i think the star day lps really contrast these quite nicely um they have a very unique style and also in that presentation about neva starnes there's also a section on there about suzanne mathis who had designed a lot of these album covers and it's her sister joni proctor who's on the cover of an awful lot of the star day lps usually the star day covers the women on the covers were uh, Star Day employees uh, who just jumped into the, the photo shoot at the last minute, or they went across the street uh, to take these pictures, or that picture of George on a horse, that's Don Pierce's horse, and uh, yeah, those kind of things. Uh, but it is a contrast to this. Um, Star Day also, I mentioned that idea of uh, authentic, custom, high-fidelity recordings, preserving the heritage of American country music. Starday really went heavy into old time and traditional music. And he felt that uh, even if an artist didn't have big hit records, if they were on the Grand Ole Opry, they had an audience. And so he put out some really iconic records that um, I think are very much in line with what Smithsonian Folkways would later be doing and with the Rounder Records much later, uh, but really trying to preserve traditional country music and he was on the back of these albums using terms like um, 
old fashioned or old time and traditional uh, long before we would call this classic country music. Um, and so I think these are really important LPs. So many great string bean records were on here. Um, he also put out some really great instrumental records, um, which I am a huge fan of. And a lot of bands like Hank Snow's band, Jim Reeves' band, Roy Acuff's band, a lot of folks who were on other major labels, their bands came to start a and put out records of their own. Eddie Arnold's band, backing up Little Roy on some of those stuff. Um, but yeah, really interesting record labels there. That Rainbow Ranch Boys one is really good. Um, and Pete Drake, of course, the house, one of the most popular house musicians at the Start A studio, recorded a lot there. And Start A also at this time, the studio became known as sort of the like Start A nightclub people would joke about, but they did a lot of live albums in the studio with country comedians. And Don told me he had recorded just about every country comedian he could think of. Um, because he really liked those sessions of just doing uh, some live recordings in the Star Day studio. And there are a ton of really funny country humor records there uh, with Cousin Minnie Pearl and others. And one of the cool things about Star Day was, uh, <laughs> I guess I, I can say cool, some people would find annoying, uh, concept LPs. I really love concept LPs. Some people might be annoyed that they already have these songs because they were repackaged in some other album. Um, but it was just sort of a way to reuse songs again and again. Um, Don would maybe lease one song from Pickwick, like um, uh, as an example, Johnny Cash, um, Folsom Prison. And then he would build an entire album around prison songs because he had one song by Johnny Cash. Um, and that's how he would build these whole concept LPs. And when I, as I was going through, uh, when I was working on the Star Day book, uh, going through Don's desk and finding stuff. Uh, Jack Lineman there had a whole bunch of notes about potential album ideas. So I have all these notes of uh, Star Day albums that never never existed but could have, which I think is cool. The most popular thing they did, though, in terms of concept LPs was truck driving records. They became the truck driving label uh, throughout the mid to late 1960s. And big hits by the Willis Brothers. Uh, give me 40 acres to turn this rig around phantom 309 giddy up go by red savine and uh just had a lot of success with truck driving songs there's a, a video i can also share in the padlet uh in which i talk about the history of star day truck driving music we will talk for another time but there's so many great truck driving album covers with a lot of star day employees and i also as i was going through photos um i found a whole stash of joan proctor that's suzanne mathis's sister I mentioned a whole bunch of out, outtakes of truck driving photo covers and stuff. So I included one there on the bottom, but uh, pretty pretty fun to go through all these truck driving things. Uh, in order to sell all those records uh, that I just showed you, uh, they created the, uh, what is it called? The Country Music Record Club of America and just basically started this, uh, built that giant warehouse I showed you in the earlier picture and started a record club to give away records, to give away um, little pins. I have a pin somewhere and I couldn't find it, but I do have my Country Music Record Club of America playing cards with different country music artists on each card, which are pretty cool. And uh, yeah, the you know, official, one of the taxpayer, uh, US taxpayer and charter member of the Country Music Record Club. Uh, and that's Cindy Lou, uh, a Star Day employee who ran the record club. Uh, I also thought I'd give brief mention to some of the other things. Uh, even though Star Day was sort of built up as the, uh, you know, all those LPs and everything said from Nashville, Tennessee, the musical heart of America. It says that on here too. From Nashville, Tennessee, the musical heart of America. Uh, the irony is that Star Day was never based in Nashville. It never was a Nashville label. If anything, it's the anti Nashville label uh, because. He would record all of the acts that the major record companies in Nashville wouldn't record. And so artists like Cowboy Copas and Red Sovine and Johnny Bond had been dropped by major labels. And Stardy was the smaller independent label who would scoop them up and record them anyway and found a lot of success doing that. Um, but also the fact that he built his studio outside of Nashville so that he intentionally wouldn't be part of that particular scene. Uh, so I, I've always thought it interesting that Started was never based in Nashville, but they claimed Nashville's musical heart of America on all their merchandise. Uh, but he did heavily invest in Nashville and the idea of country music in Nashville because he wanted Music City 
to continue to grow as that would attract more business for all of country music. He was a founding member of uh, the Country Music Association and very much committed to building the brand of country music. So he did a couple things I think I'd point out here. He invested heavily in the Sulphur Dell Speedways, which was a figure eight racetrack in Nashville. They took the old Sulphur Dell Baseball Stadium and turned it into a figure eight racetrack. Fair and Young was a big uh, proponent of this. And uh, Tommy Hill used to drive hot rods around San Antonio. So they built up the Starday Cannonball. There's a picture of he and Chuck Chelman working on it. Johnny Bond has an album cover and at the Sulphur Dell Speedway. You can see Biff Colley there uh, racing a car. Pretty fun adventure uh, to invest in. Don also invested some of the Starday money into movies. And Ron Ormond, who was a Hollywood B-movie maker, did a lot of films with Lash LaRue, King of the Bullwhip. Well, he moved to Nashville. And Don Pierce was one of his first investors because he took country music stars, uh, Ralph Emery and others, to um, make movies with. And Girl from Tobacco Rose even filmed out at Don Pierce's place, which is kind of cool. Um, the Exotic Ones features Starday artist Sleepy Labeef um, ripping off a guy's arm and beating him to death with it in a really strange comedic drive-in movie, 1960s weird way, uh, but definitely worth watching. And uh, all these movies are pretty fun. And in addition to the country music exploitation films, I think Don was probably most proud of building the Music City Pro Celebrity Golf Tournament, which he founded in 1964. There's Alice Cooper golfing at it one year. It went for many years. Uh, Don Pierce actually won it one year with Bobby Lord and his childhood golf hero, Dutch Harrison. Um, but that was a a way to bring Perry Como to Nashville, who later recorded at Nashville, and just sort of bring a lot of celebrity and public attention to Nashville. And the teams were usually a celebrity, a, a country gentleman, a, um, and a and a country music star. And so uh, it was a way to connect country music to the city of Nashville through golf, which was Don's big pat one of Don's big passions. And then I thought I would spend a little bit of time here as we're nearing. <laughs> The end. I wanted to talk about the Starday Studio. It was built and opened up in May of 1960. I showed you some of those early pictures. And um, it was very successful for a really long time. Tommy Hill sort of took over the studio and without any experience, figured out how to run this thing and make really great recordings. And um, Hoss Linneman also produced there. The first time I saw it was in 2004. And there's a picture of the studio from 2003. And David McKinley was working there. And uh, he gave me a tour of this place. Um, I mean, it's a, a fascinating studio. So what I can tell you about it is that for about 30 years, it was active. And they made a lot of great records, uh, including the famous James Brown record. He did two sessions there. Um, but by 1990, most of the gear had been sold off. And for the last 10 years of its life, it was really just a mastering facility. And David McKinley, who, who was working there as the mastering engineer in 2004, Gave me the tour, showed me a few, few things that were left, uh, and Charlie Dick uh, came over and talked about Patsy recording there and some of his memories of that. It was, it was a really memorable tour of the studio. I really appreciated it. And then about a year later, it was abandoned. And it was abandoned because uh, it had constant roof leaks, uh, water leaks, electrical problems, rat infestations, mold problems, and the repairs got so costly that Mo Lytle, the owner of the studio just decided it's it's not worth it and he left it and it got flooded and it just got worse and worse and totally dilapidated i would go by every year to look at it when i was in nashville and there i would notice things like bullet holes in the windows and coming from the inside so we knew there were squatters there and it just got progressively worse and a lot of people tried to buy it over the years um but there was never really a plan of who should buy it or what could be done with it a lot of people wanted it um but by 2015, it was beyond repair. So in 2016, uh, Historic Nashville Inc. published their Nashville Nine, which is a grouping of historic properties that are either abandoned or imminent danger. And they said that somebody should, we need to save this studio. And there was even a public petition started um, that, that had a lot of inaccuracies saying it was George Jones' studio or Willie Nelson's studio, even though they'd never recorded there. Um, even calling it James Brown's studio, uh, was, was uh, I think, not fair since he only did two sessions there. Uh, and they had mentioned Jimi Hendrix's studio, which I thought, no, uh, he did one session there and it got edited out. He's not even heard on the record. Uh, that all the reasons I just showed you are why I think this is an incredibly important studio. But uh, 
I was cited as I, I gave them a lot of feedback and said, please, you're not citing any of the, the reasons this is actually an important building. And they didn't listen to any of my suggestions uh, in the Nashville, Tennessee and published a letter um, uh, with a public petition to save the studio. And they even cited, we sourced Nate Gibson, who uh, is a reference for this story, which I thought, no, no, I'm not. I really don't think it should be saved. I don't think it can be saved. And I gave a bunch of reasons why. Um, there's a, the building's beyond repair. Nashville doesn't really need another studio. All of the tourist attractions in Nashville that aren't centrally located downtown eventually fail or close, and it's not for sale. The owner won't sell it. Um, and I gave many other reasons um, why I didn't think it could be saved and why I didn't think it should be saved. Um, but that didn't feel super great uh, because obviously I love Stardate and I think the legacy should be preserved, but I don't think that building was the way to do it. And I didn't really feel like you need a building to preserve the legacy. So after pointing all those things out, I gave a talk at Belmont. I think it was called like the nine reasons we shouldn't save the Stardate studio or something. Uh, that really got me thinking, well, if we can't save that building, what can we do? Um, so I loaded up my car with a lighting kit and a bunch of video equipment and microphones and instruments. And I drove all over the country finding everybody I could who had recorded for Stardate. Uh, not everybody, but I found a lot of people. I ended up tracking down 14 artists and we made a record together and not just making a record, but I did long interviews and video interviews um, with everybody sharing memories about the Stardate studio, about Stardate records in general and about their careers. And I got some help from friends, um, my favorite band in the entire world, Marty Stewart and the fabulous superlatives who I think are just wonderful, um, helped him with this project. And eventually uh, I did a Kickstarter to try to raise funds for it because it's very expensive to do that. And Bear Family came in and issued the, the project. So um, they put out Nate Gibson of the Stars of Stardate. And I got to thinking to anybody who has ever done field work to any degree uh, can attest when you interview folks and when you um, become very connected personally with a lot of musicians, employees, family members, who I would call the Stardate community, uh, it's sort of a lifelong project. So I wrote this book, gosh, uh, more than a decade ago now. And it's still sort of a lifelong venture to always be an advocate for the folks who helped me tell their story. Uh, and so I, I think there's a lot of ways we can tell the Stardate story without that building, be it through records, be it through books, online documentaries, talks like the one today. Uh, thanks again to the Tennessee Historical Society. Uh, and just investing in the people who are with us who can share their stories. And so uh, that's what I, I really spent the last few years working on is just uh, sitting down and talking with some of my favorite musicians. And, uh, you know, there's <clears throat> uh, Darnell Miller, Bill Clifton, um, Margie Singleton. Uh, I don't even want to forget anybody. June Stearns, Wade Jackson, Arnold Parker, Sleepy Labeef, Jesse McReynolds, um, Betty Amos with Judy and Jean, Darnell Miller, Frankie Miller, Rudy Tutti Grizel, and little Roy Lewis. We're all part of that project. And um, I think, you know, there's so many other starting artists who are still around, still performing. Frankie told me he's going to be performing some dates with Willie Nelson this year, which is super exciting. And you shouldn't miss that if you can avoid it. I know Bull and Phipps is still singing with his family members. Uh, Ronnie and Donna Stoneman, uh, Larry Sparks. I just saw him in Madison just a short while ago. Um, I know little Roy is still tearing, tearing up the guitar and the banjo. Um, yeah. So what I, what I hope is, is that as a way to sort of preserve the Stardate legacy, we engage with all the Stardate artists who made it important. June Stearns, Ann Ray, Jesse McReynolds, Karen Wheeler, Judy Lee, uh, many more. Um, uh, so that's that's my hope, and I, I keep I'll keep working on it. I have two more projects that I can't really discuss at length right now, but there will be two new Star Day projects coming out later this year, uh, which is very exciting. And there's a bunch of links here. Oh, I was going to show you. Yeah, <laughs> that's the last time I went to the Star Day studio uh, just last year in May. I took these pictures, and you can see. Now it's just completely, I didn't go inside the building. These are all pictures I took just from looking, peering through the door. But in the back there where the studio is, somebody just bowled down that that door. And um, I peeked in, and that's what you see when you peek in. And the office area has the roof caved in. 
I went to a bar later that night in Nashville and I was saying, gosh, that studio was just completely ransacked. And somebody was like, yeah, I know. I went in there and I took Tommy Hill's desk. And I was like, what? Uh, unbelievable. So people had been knowing that this would be demolished for a long time. And then I got a call from Kenny in, in August, just this August, who was like, hey, man, it's finally gone. So Starday Studio is gone. The legacy of Starday is not. And I hope that you will help with me sharing it when time if you're a musician, sing the songs. If you are an interested party, talk to the Starday artists and uh, engage in keeping the music and their memories alive. So uh, with that, I think I'll open it up. We have still nine minutes. If you have any questions for me, or if you'd like to chat about any specific area, there's a ton of links there. Um, yeah. Thanks so much for letting me chat.